Please hold up one hand. Place your thumb over your palm. Wrap your four fingers over your thumb. This is a crude representation of the human brain. The four fingers represent the prefrontal cortex. This is where we do our thinking, where we process our thoughts. The thumb represents the limbic system. This is the epicenter of fight, flight, or freeze. Intellect, feelings. Logic, emotion. How does this feel when you go to work? For 70% of Americans, not good. Toxic managers, complaining coworkers, feeling undervalued. This has neurological consequences when we go into a negative workplace environment. When we don't feel safe, the brain reacts within three one hundredths of a second. The limbic system starts to hijack mental ability from the rest of the brain to deal with the perceived threat. We then cope with that threat or how to respond to it. When this happens at work, employees lose focus, they feel defensive, they aren't sure of themselves, and their mental capacity starts to decline. When this happens at home, at school, in sports, wherever we are, the brain reacts the same. The fact is the limbic system doesn't know whether it's at home or at work. It only knows whether or not it feels safe. So why are so many people unhappy with their jobs and consequently their lives, and what can we do about it? The answer begins in the brain. Human beings are hardwired to connect with others. We are, at our core, herd animals. Now, we don't grow up in tight-knit tribes anymore, but where do we spend most of our time when we're awake with other adults? Work. This is the new tribe for the 21st century Homo sapien. Now, what I want you to do for a moment is to imagine your ideal work environment, a place that energizes you and where you feel proud to contribute every day. Imagine also a society where we look forward to going to work on Monday mornings as much as we do today leaving on Friday afternoons. This ideal work environment does exist in some places today, but it's the exception, not the norm. How did we get here? Picture me standing on a timeline. I'm standing on today. The future is that way and the past is over here. Now I'm going to walk down the timeline. I'm going to go back about 200 years. This is when the United States shifted from an agricultural economy and the industrial age began. From the beginning of the Industrial Revolution until today, there's been one constant about labor that has allowed employers to essentially disregard the emotional and physical well-being of employees. There have always been more people than jobs. And in this era, if you had a job, what was the most important thing to you? Keeping it. More than security, a job represented survival your ability to feed and to house your family. And every day, in the most toxic conditions, millions of Americans would go to work, regardless. This overabundance of labor allowed companies to essentially ignore the fundamentals of what allows human beings to thrive and perform at their best. If you complained too much, if you couldn't handle the environment, it was easy to replace you. Three things will change this forever. A crippling labor shortage, a new generation of workers, and the adoption by business of what neuroscience now tells us allows human beings to thrive. First, the labor shortage. The era of labor abundance is over and it's never coming back. We are on the cliff edge of the most severe talent shortfall we have ever faced in the history of our economy. Just last month alone, the U.S. economy added 300,000 new jobs, which is great news, but it also got us to a 17-year low in unemployment. We're at full employment today in the United States, 6 million unfilled jobs. This is going to force companies to rethink the way they attract and retain workers. Second, look around you. Millennials and Gen Z. They are now the largest segment of the U.S. labor force, and with them, they bring a new perspective on work. 
they don't work simply to survive. They work to bring freedom and fulfillment into their lives. They work to enrich their lives and the world with social good. They will recoil at toxic managers. And in fact, they already are, which is in part why this generation's average job tenure today is just about at two and a half years. The third issue is that neuroscience is going to show us this new way to allow employees to thrive, to be more productive and innovative when they get to work. The fact is the future of work will be defined more by how it feels than how it pays. The future of work will be defined more by how it feels than how it pays. Let me give you an example. Let's say I come to work and I bring 100% of my mental capacity. Six months ago, my company hired Kate. She's hardworking, smart, and always has my back. Have you ever worked with someone like that? My brain actually sees Kate as an extension of my own ability. So what's happened over the last six months is my mental capacity has actually increased to 150% because I get to work with her. This is literally a case of one plus one equals three. Now, there's a flip side to this. Let's say I come to work on Monday morning and Kate tells me she's moving. Do I still come to work with 150% after I hear this news? No. I might drop to 60 or 70%. And the work that I did on Friday with ease today feels almost impossible. It takes me longer to accomplish it and it's harder to get it done. When I work with someone like Kate, my mental capacity literally expands. The brain makes better decisions more quickly when it can do so with reliable others. Outside of the workplace, this need for human connection is even more profound. There is a pandemic of loneliness spreading across America. And there's some irony here. At the very same time, technology has exponentially increased our ability to connect and engage with others. There is a pervasive felt sense of loneliness and isolation in America that has doubled at the same time from 20 to 40%. One former U.S. Surgeon General refers to this pandemic of loneliness as one of the most serious public health threats facing America today. So where is the biggest opportunity to forge these safe and secure relationships? Work. And it's funny about business. They use science in almost every aspect of what they do with the exception of human relationships. And this is why I recently wrote a book that was published by Forbes. My team and I work with thousands of employees across nearly every industry. And we ask these employees to answer 28 questions that represent key drivers of human behavior. And when you measure engagement, it turns out it looks like a bell curve. Now, on the right side of this bell curve in the green area are the A and B players. These are the employees that are positive. They've already found meaningful ways to engage with other members of their tribe. They're innovative, creative, and they're supportive of other members. The C and D players are the employees that are showing up just to collect a paycheck. You may have had to work with some of these people, grudge collecting, victim mentality, always complaining, glass always half empty people. It's painful and their negativity is toxic, contagious, and exhausting. When you give leaders new science-based leadership skills, the transformation in a workplace culture is nothing short of remarkable. This chart represents all of the companies that have worked with us in their first four years. And that expanding green bar represents a 75% increase in the employee engagement in these companies, and as a direct result, their well-being. This is a remarkable shift and an example of what can happen when you give leaders new skills. We show leaders how the limbic system is focused on two brain-based imperatives every day, threat detection and the need to belong. 
One neuroscientist characterized this in this way, saying that the limbic system is asking two questions, wondering about these two questions all the time. What's next and how am I doing? Leaders could create a much safer workplace if they could simply do a better job addressing these two brain-based imperatives. So let's start with the first one. What's next? Predictability and consistency trump virtually every other factor when people go to work. We can also be very tactical and literally answer the question, sharing more with them, being more inclusive about what's happening next week, next month. And a very powerful tool very few managers use is actually explain to them what their flight plan is inside the company. What's my future? What's next for me here? The next question, how am I doing? We address this by giving leaders three essential skills to answer this question. First, validate. Every day, we need to signal to every employee that they mean something to us. Hello, good morning. Even the simple smile with direct eye contact as you pass someone in the hallway is enough to share that they mean something to you. Second, recognition. This needs to happen every week. Managers need to look for some example of discretionary effort that employees have given during that week and simply comment on it. Being specific is really helpful. Ed, thank you so much for getting that proposal out so quickly. It really shows how responsive we can be. Third, constructive feedback, not constructive criticism. This is transformational. Effective feedback is an ongoing, two-way, supportive conversation between a manager and their direct reports. We all could do this more in our daily lives when we hold people accountable to do it with less negativity. Anything overtly critical is a punch to the brain. In every relationship you have, it takes five positives to neutralize one negative. Five to one. When leaders become more intentional about creating a positive relational workplace culture, everything shifts. And this is when our brain opens up and makes us more available to other people in our lives. This is how the workplace can help all of our relationships. If you want to know what your culture is in your home, at work, all you have to do is answer this one question. What does it feel like to be here? Happy, fulfilled, fearful, anxious? The way you answer that question, how you feel, is predictive of your behavior. Emotion drives behavior. And when we begin to embrace this within the workplace, we see remarkable shifts. When we come to work at a place where we thrive, where we find meaning and purpose in what we do, we do become happier and healthier. And when leaders embrace a new workplace model based on these neurological insights, everything shifts. Some of you may feel that what I've talked about feels like common sense. And to the brain, it certainly is. But here's the rub for those of you that think you've heard this or have known this already. Common sense is not common practice. We can all do more. The future of work will indeed be defined by how it feels rather than how it pays. Only now, science shows us exactly what we need to do so that all of us can thrive by design. Thank you.